Prison Writings, My Life is My Sundance, by Leonard Peltier. Part 3. Growing Up Indian A Strong Leader Shows Mercy Chapter 13 Like most Indian people, I have several names. In Indian way, names come to you in the course of your life, not just when you were born. Some come during childhood ceremonies. Others are given on special occasions throughout your life. Each name gives you a new sense of yourself and your own possibilities. And each name gives you something to live up to. It points out the direction you're supposed to take in this life. One of my names is Tate Wikua, which means wind chases the sun in Dakota language. That name was my great-grandfather's. Another name bestowed on me by my native Canadian brethren is Warthi Las. He leads the people. I find special inspiration in both of those names. The first, to me, represents total freedom, a goal even most of those outside prison walls never achieve. When I think that name to myself, wind chases the sun, I feel free in my heart, able to melt through the stone walls and steel bars and ride the wind through pure sunlight into the sky world. No walls or bars or rolls of razor wire can stop me from doing that. And the second name, He Leads the People, to me, represents total commitment, a goal I strive for even within these walls, reaching out as best I can to help my people. Maybe it seems presumptuous, even absurd, a man like me in prison for two lifetimes speaking of leading his people. But like Nelson Mandela, you never know when you will suddenly and unexpectedly be called upon. He too knows what it's like to sit here in prison, year after year, decade after decade. I try to keep myself ready, if ever I am needed. I work at it within these walls with my fellow inmates, with my supporters around the world, with people of good will everywhere. A strong leader shows mercy. He compromises for the good of all. He listens to every side and never makes hasty decisions that could hurt the people. I'm trying very hard to be the kind of leader I myself could respect. So, in our way, my names tell me and others who I am. Each of my names should be an inspiration to me. Here at Lavenworth, in fact anywhere in the U.S. prison system, my official name is number 896-37-132. Not much imagination, or inspiration there. My Christian name, though I don't consider myself to be a Christian, is Leonard Peltier. The last name's French, from the French fur hunters and voyagers who came through our country more than a century ago. And I take genuine pride in that holy blood, too. The name is a shortening of Pelletier, but has come to be pronounced, in the American fashion, Peltier. My first name was given to me by my grandmother, who said I cried so hard as a baby that I sounded like a little lion. She named me Leonard, she said, because it sounded like lion-hearted. I don't know how she figured that out, but years later, I looked it up in a dictionary of names and found that Leonard literally means lion-hearted. Though my bloodline is predominantly Ojibwe and Dakota Sioux, I have also married into and been adopted in the traditional way by the Lakota Sioux people. All the Lakota... Dakota, Nakota people, also known as Sioux, are one great nation of nations. We Indians are many nations, but one people. I myself was brought up on both Sioux and Ojibwe, Chippewa, reservations in the land known to you as America. I would like to say with all sincerity and with no disrespect that I don't consider myself an American citizen. I am a native of Great Turtle Island. I am of the Ikse. Wikasa, the common people, the original people. Our sacred land is under occupation, and we are now all prisoners, not just me. Even so, I love being an Indian. For all its burdens and all its responsibilities, being an Indian is my greatest pride. I thank Wakantanka, the great mystery, for making me Indian. I love my people. If you must accuse me of something, accuse me of that, being Indian. To that crime, and to that crime alone, I plead guilty. My crimes being an Indian, 
What's yours? Chapter 14 When you grow up Indian, you quickly learn that the so-called American dream isn't for you. For you, that dream's a nightmare. Ask any Indian kid. You're out just walking across the street of some little off-reservation town, and there's this white cop suddenly comes up to you, grabs you by your long hair, pushes you against the car, frisks you, gives you a couple good jabs with his nightstick, then sends you off with a warning sneer. Watch yourself, Tonto. He doesn't do that to white kids, just Indians. You can hear him chuckling with delight as you limp off, clutching your bruised ribs. If you talk smart when they hassle you, off to the slammer you go. Keep these engines in their place, you know? Truth is, they actually need us. Who else would they fill up their jails and prisons with in places like the Dakotas and New Mexico if they didn't have Indians? Think of all the cops and judges and guards and lawyers who'd be out of work if they didn't have Indians to oppress. We keep the system going. We help give the American system of injustice the criminals it needs. At least being prison fodder is some kind of reason for being. Prison's the only university, the only finishing school many young Indian brothers ever see. Same for blacks and Latinos. So-called Latinos, of course, are what white man calls Indians who live south of the Rio Grande. White man's books will tell you there are only 2.5 million or so of us Indians here in America, but there are more than 200 million of us right here in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, and hundreds of millions more indigenous people around this Mother Earth. We are the original people. We are one of the fingers on the hand of mankind. Why is it we are unrepresented in our own lands, and without seats, or many seats, in the United Nations? Why is it we're allowed to send our delegates only to prisons and to cemeteries? Oddly enough, oppressed by the same people, we Indians often wind up fighting each other for what few perks are left to us in prison or society at large. Set them against each other and let them fight it out while we rip them off. That's been white man's strategy for 500 years, and hey... It's worked damn well for them. So when you grow up Indian, you don't have to become a criminal. You already are a criminal. You never know innocence. I was brought up into a world like that. It's a world most white people never see and will never know. When they happen to drive by an Indian res while out on vacation to see the four white presidential faces that desecrate the face of the holy mountain they call Mount Rushmore, they gawk at us. They don't stop and say hello. They don't wave. They don't smile. They gawk. Look, the parents tell the kids as they pass by in their shiny car pointing their fingers at us. There's an Indian! Chapter 15 People drive through a reservation and see half a dozen junk cars in some Indian family's front yard, and they shake their heads saying, These dirty Indians. How can they live like that? Why don't they get rid of those drunkers? Maybe these people, so quick to judge, don't understand the higher mathematics of being poor. They don't realize that when you can't afford to buy or commercially repair a car, it may take six or eight junkers out in the yard to keep one junker going on the road. Those yard junkers take on special value in Indian eyes. They're the source of that hard-to-come-by and almost sacred commodity in Indian country, transportation. Without wheels in the empty distances of the res, you're utterly isolated. When the family's one working car breaks down, one of those yard junkers may provide precisely the part that's needed so that Pop can drive 70 miles to town each day to his menial job and help feed his often hungry family. To such a family, those junkers out in the yard represent survival. Besides, there's often some old auntie who sleeps, even lives in those old wrecks, and if you open up the trunk or glove compartment, you'll often see lovingly stacked rows of Indian corn and beans, sage and sweetgrass, arranged there like fine jewels. There's poetry in those junkyards. Those old junkers can hold holy things in their rusted innards. Sort of like us Indians. Remember that next time you drive through a res and see those junkers in the yard. They're holy too. Chapter 16 I was born on September 12, 1944, in Grand Forks, North Dakota. My father, Leo, was three-fourths Chippewa Ojibwe, and he always told us one-fourth French. 
My mother, Alvina Showers, had a Dakota Sioux mother and a Chippewa father. When I was four, my parents separated, then divorced, and my sister, Betty Ann, and I went to live with my father's parents, Alex and Mary Du Bois Peltier, on the Turtle Mountain Reservation, about four miles north of Belcourt, North Dakota. In Indian way, the grandparents often bring up the kids. The old knowledge passes down not so much from parent to child as from grandparent to grandchild. That's in part why we honor our elders. In our way, when you grow old, you become an elder. And that's something to look forward to your whole life. So being raised by my grandparents, gramps and grandma we little kids called them, was one of the truly beautiful things in my life. Grandma taught me the old songs and stories, and even a little medicine. Gramps would take me out hunting, show me how to make things, how to survive on your own in the wild. As a child, I became fluent in Mietis, a French-Indian mixture, as well as English, and I also spoke some Sioux, Ojibwe, and French words. Since every language gives you a different view of reality, I soon saw that there were many realities you'd have to cope with in this life, most of them unpleasant. At the time, our family used to work in the potato fields, migrating during harvest season from the reservation to the Red River Valley. You pick the spuds by hand, getting only eight to ten cents for a bushel. My job when I was small was to run up ahead and shake the spuds loose from the vines so that others could come along and pick them up more quickly. We lived at the time in a small log house, about 20 feet by 15 feet. No water or electricity. We carried water from a distant spring or well. I worked long hours, grew big and strong, and had no particular complaints about life, hard as it was. From my earliest years, living through each day was a matter of survival. That's just the way it was. It seemed natural. It made a survivor of me, that hard life. I've been a survivor ever since. I was brought up with both Christian religion and Indian traditional religion. My grandmother believed in Indian traditional religion and was also a Catholic. Everyone knew that if you were Catholic, or at least Christian, you got more government assistance. I attended both kinds of services. Grandma didn't really get the spiritual relief she was seeking out of the Catholic's religion, so she never stopped going to Indian ceremonies. For medical problems, she often went to a medicine man. That's how I was introduced to Indian religion. I was also introduced to Catholic religion, but that was something that I lost faith in at an early age. I must have been about nine years old. I remember thinking to myself that I could never be a good, believing Catholic. It all seemed so harsh and far removed and devoid of human caring, at least where Indians were concerned. I don't want to criticize Catholics. That's just the way a child saw it. Maybe they were a lot harsher in my time than today. I understand there have been changes over the years. I don't know. For the sake of Indian children still in parochial care? I hope so. In any case, I always felt more at home, more at ease with Indian religion. It made me feel like I belonged, like I was wanted as an Indian. And it also seemed loving and caring and wonderfully mystical and bound to Mother Earth and our grandfather the sky and to Wakantanka, the great mystery. And in the sweat lodge and the sun dance, it taught you to deal with pain, something white man would always see that you as an Indian would have plenty of in this life. Our elders spoke of the original instructions given to us by Wakantanka, and how the very first instruction of all is to survive. Those same elders taught us that we're not here to preserve our tradition, but to live it. Those lessons of the elders have held me in good stead throughout my life. I've needed them often, and will no doubt continue needing them. Chapter 17 Around 1950, during particularly hard times on the res, my grandfather took the family out to Montana, hoping to make some money working in the mines or logging camps there. We lived a while in Butte where, at age six, I got everyone in trouble by refusing to run away when three white kids started flinging rocks at me. Go home, you dirty Indian, they laughed, using me for what they thought was a defenseless target. I got hit several times before I picked up a small rock, really just a large pebble, and sent it whistling back at them in defense. Damned if it didn't hit one of them smack on the temple. I could see the blood running down his face, and he was screaming like he was about to die. I was terrified. 
I ran home, hid under the bed, and prayed and prayed that the white boy wouldn't die. Oh, let him live, I remember crying. Let him live! A while later, a big shiny automobile came pulling up in front of our little rented house. Big shiny automobiles always spell trouble for Indians. A white woman got out. She was yelling and screaming and carrying on, warning she was going to have me put away in the reformatory and calling grandma dirty names like stupid bitch and filthy squaw, things like that. When she left, she shouted she was going right to the police, have the whole dirty bunch of us thrown in jail. I listened to it all from under the bed, shivering the whole while. When grandma came in and demanded to know what happened, I was too scared even to talk. I just held my hand to my mouth. That was one of the few times Gramps ever spanked me. Words and a hard look were usually all that was necessary to keep discipline in our family. But that time, Gramps really gave it to me with a horse strap. I kept my hand over my mouth the whole spanking so I wouldn't cry. And he really laid into me. Finally, I told him what had happened. He shook his head, with tears welling up in the wrinkled corners of his eyes. And then he smiled, the saddest smile and patted me on the head. He said I wasn't wrong, but that I shouldn't have done it. Throw that stone back at them. I should have thought of the family. Now we'd all have to pack up quickly and get out of there before the law came and made big trouble. You're not supposed to rile these white folks, boy, Graham said. They'll come back and get you every time. That's just the way they are. We packed up and headed to North Dakota that very evening. Nobody chided me about it again. In fact, my sister clapped her hands and declared me a hero. Not a hero, Gramp said. He's a warrior. I took tremendous pride in that. After Gramps died of pneumonia when I was eight, life became really hard for us. My grandmother was left alone. She spoke hardly any English, had almost no income, and was trying to raise three small kids, me, my sister, and our cousin Pauline. I tried stalking the table with my slingshot, coming up with an occasional squirrel or maybe a small bird. Mostly, Grandma used them to flavor otherwise vegetarian soup. I could never seem to catch a rabbit with my slingshot, like the fat ones Gramps had gotten now and then with his single shot twenty-two, for Grandma's beloved rabbits do. Given the cold Dakota win given the cold North Dakota winters, hunger became a really big problem for us. We had no bread, no milk, hardly anything else. I thought that gnawing ache in my belly was just the way I was supposed to feel. One day in the fall of 1953, a big black government car came and took us kids away to the Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding school in Wapaton, North Dakota. I remember Grandma weeping in the doorway as she watched them take us off. We had no suitcases, just bundles. First thing after we got there, they cut off our long hair, stripped us naked, then doused us in powdered DDT. I thought I was going to die. That place, I can tell you, was very, very strict. It was more like a reformatory than a school. You were whacked on the butt with the yardstick for the smallest infraction. Even if you so much as looked someone in the eye, that was considered insubordination, trying to relate to another person as a human being. I consider my years at Wapaton my first imprisonment, and it was for the same crime as all the others, being an Indian. We had to speak English. We were beaten if we were caught speaking our own language. Still, we did. We'd sneak behind the buildings the way kids today sneak out to smoke behind the school, and we'd talk Indian to each other. I guess that's where I first became a hardened criminal, as the FBI calls me. And you could say the first infraction in my criminal career was speaking my own language. There's an act of violence for you. Chapter 18 after graduating from Wapaton in 1957, I went to Flandreau, down in South Dakota, where I finished ninth grade. I then went back home to Turtle Mountain Reservation, where my father had returned to live. I guess I was growing up to be a pretty normal teenager. I wanted a car, and built one out of spare parts. I got so good at it that later on, in Seattle, I would get into the body and fender shop business. Living on the res as a young teen, I attended lots of powwows and religious ceremonies but I also went to the largely white school dances and listened to a lot of rock radio. Elvis, the Everly Brothers, Buddy Holly were some of my favorites. 
I was drawn to both cultures. I found myself spread-eagled between them, really. And, like many of my Indian brothers and sisters, I was nearly torn apart by the contradictions and conflict between the two that I both saw in the outside world and felt within myself. This was during the last years of the Eisenhower administration, when a resolution was passed by Congress and signed by President Eisenhower to terminate all Indian reservations and to relocate us off our lands and into cities. Those suddenly became the most important, the most feared words in our vocabulary. Termination and relocation. I can think of few words more sinister in the English language, at least to Indian people. I guess the Jews in Europe must have felt the same way about Nazi words like final solution and resettlement in the East. To us, those words were an assault to our very existence as people, an attempt to eradicate us. We were given two choices, either relocate or starve. Later, court decisions would declare this compulsory policy totally illegal, which it was, but that was no comfort to us at the time. We pleaded with the government to let us stay on our land and to create some employment on the reservation, as they had promised to do, but all that was in vain. The ones we went to for help, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, were the last ones, it seemed, with any intention of helping us. It's no accident that the BIA started off back in the 1800s as part of the Department of War. They're still waging war on us today. To implement their inhumane policy, the federal government in the late 1950s cut off the reservation's already meager supply of food and commodities. The pitiful little payment they'd promised in those treaties to recompense us for all the vast holy continent they'd stolen. Hunger was the only thing we had plenty of. Yeah, there was plenty of that to go around. Enough for everybody. When frantic mothers took their bloated-bellied children to, to the clinic, the nurses smiled and told... When frantic mothers took their... Be when frantic mothers took their bloated-bellied children to the clinic... When frantic mothers took their bloated-bellied children to the clinic, the nurses smiled and told them the children had just had gas. A little girl who lived right near us on the reservation died of malnutrition. Sounds like termination to me. Termination was nothing new in red-white relations, really. They'd been trying to terminate us since 1492. They've always wanted to get rid of us. And I suppose they'll never stop trying. Indian people were offered money to get off the res and move to cities, like Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Los Angeles, and Chicago where all those wonderful inner-city slums and mean streets were waiting for us. With the reservation under threat of termination, housing was severely limited. Our lands were being leased right out from under us by white ranchers and mining interests, or annexed by the U.S. government. My family, like many others, wound up with nowhere to stay. We were being all but forced off the res to go to the newly sprouting urban red ghettos the government was so keen on sending us to. Sometimes we shuttled between relatives. Sometimes we slept in the car. I was about 14 at the time. My dad, who'd returned to live with us, had started attending community meetings on the reservation to discuss the government's decision to terminate Turtle Mountain. I went along with him to those meetings, more to eat the few little snacks they served on such occasions than to hear the political arguments. But at one of those meetings, I chanced to do a little listening for a change, and something started stirring deep inside me, even deeper than the hunger in my belly. Some women were weeping aloud about having starving children at home. One Ojibwe lady, a cousin of mine, I'll always remember it, stood up angrily and asked in a loud, emotional, tear-filled voice, Where are our warriors? Why don't they stand up and fight for their starving people? That sent electric vibrations from my scalp all the way down my spine to the soles of my feet. It was like a revelation to me that there was actually something worthwhile you could do with your life. Something more important than living your own selfish little life day by day. Yes, there was something more important than your poor, miserable life. Your people. You could actually stand up and fight for them. Now that was something I had never learned in school or heard on the radio. I'd only learned in school and from society at large that being Indian was something I was supposed to be ashamed of. Something I was supposed to cast aside for my own well-being. Kill the Indian, save the man. That was their official motto. 
Now here, this woman was challenging me to the roots of my being with the notion of the people. Yes, the people, the Teospe, as the Lakota called the extended family, and by extension, as I would come to see in later years, all Indian people, all indigenous people, all human beings of good heart. I vowed right then and there that I would become a warrior and that I'd always work to help my people. It's a vow I've done my best to keep. About that same time, I renewed my interest in Indian religion and Indian way, taking part in ceremonies and sensing something echoing deep inside myself. One night in 1958, a few friends and I sneaked out to watch the sun dance at Turtle Mountain, which was held secretly because piercing went on, which was illegal at the time. We got a few close-up glimpses of the sun dancers, with the rivulets of blood running down their chests. I was impressed that no one was screaming, or hollering, or whimpering. Those guys looked fiercely proud. I envied them and vowed that someday I would be a sun dancer. Then my friends and I were actually arrested by the BIA police as we came out of the Sundance grounds. They claimed that we were drunk, a total lie, and jailed us overnight. They were afraid to arrest the Sundancers, who would surely have put up a fight. But we young teenagers were there, and we were Indian, so why not arrest us? They did. Here I was, not yet fifteen. And already I was getting first-hand experience in government-fabricated criminal charges and false imprisonment. I began to realize that my real crime was simply being who I was, an Indian. So speaking my language was my first crime, and practicing my religion was the second. When I was also arrested that winter for siphoning some diesel fuel from an army reserve truck to heat my grandmother's freezing house, I was arrested again and spent a couple of weeks in jail. That was my first stretch of hard time. So trying to keep my family from freezing was my third crime the third strike against me. Henceforth, I would be considered incorrigible. My career as a hardened criminal was already well on its way. That harvest time, I planned to work in the potato fields to earn some money for clothes and return to school. But in 1958, there was an early September frost that year, then a blizzard, killing the crops. No work. No money. Winter was coming fast and hard. No way I could go back to school. I only had rags to wear. I remember I'd gotten more and more interested in Indian art, especially painting. Even as a little kid, I once found a pocket knife in the trash, sharpened it up and started carving pieces of wood, little statues of buffaloes and dogs and birds, stuff like that. I learned to draw before I could read and write, and it was a kind of a way to communicate for me. I was an A student in school art classes. I was especially impressed by one particular man I met on the Fort Totten Reservation who went around to people's homes painting pictures in exchange for his room and board. I was fascinated by his lifestyle and the way he communicated with people through his art. That, I decided, would be the most wonderful life, just traveling around, earning your living as an artist. Dreamer that I was, I wrote to an art school I'd heard of in Santa Fe and tried to get a scholarship. They said no, but try again. I tried again a while later. Same reply, no. I often wonder what my life would have been like if I'd gotten that scholarship.